Hello and welcome to this week's Personal Passions. I've come to Leicestershire to meet John Wilkes, a composer, conductor and champion of 20th century music. He's a true renaissance man though, because he's spent over two decades building a mighty steam locomotive. This is a model of a New York Central Niagara steam locomotive. The originals were built in 1945 by the American Locomotive Company uh, for the New York Central system. This model has taken me 24 years to build. Is there a link between the kind of colossal size of an engine like the Niagara mm. and perhaps the size of, of some pieces of music? I suppose I've always been attracted to uh, the 19th century and its great achievements both in, uh, in the arts and, uh, and in engineering. And the, the, the great steam locomotives of the middle 20th century, I think, are part of that legacy, which certainly attracts me. Most people would um, not regard creative work in engineering in, in quite the same way as they would regard creative work in the arts. But uh, I don't see uh, such a great difference uh, in the embarking uh, upon a long project, whether it's a long poem, or whether it's an opera, or whether it's a symphony, or whether it's a steam locomotive. You seem to have been a champion for what is euphemistically described as difficult music. My own music in the late 1950s and early 1960s was in the avant-garde mould which um, for most uh, traditional audiences was difficult. Um, I, d I didn't find it difficult because it was my whole life. I mean, I loved it, um, but I was aware of the difficulties. I came to the conclusion in my mid-thirties that I wasn't a Stravinsky. I was never going to be a Stravinsky. And I think I didn't really want to be an also-ran. I've always wanted um, big challenges. And when I became interested in opera and uh, and singing, op um, coaching singers and conducting operas, this simply took over and this was a wonderful experience too. The sometimes cerebral art of composing music to um, getting your fingernails filthy, putting together a, an authentic steam engine. How, how did the jump happen? Well, I suppose I have to go back a long time uh, to answer that because when I was a boy, I always made things. When I had my first university job, I, I was able to realise a dream. I, I, for the first time in my life, I had a little bit of money to spend. And I was able to indulge in a little bit of metalworking, which I'd never been able to do before. You make it sound um, like some fantastic um, you know, opium-like drug that you, that you were indulging yourself well, in. Well, I suppose in some ways it is. It's a form of self-indulgence, certainly. The Niagara itself, out of all the many different classes of locomotive that were built this century, what was it that inspired you to, to recreate uh, the might of that particular locomotive? It must largely be appearance, the aesthetic qualities. To me, it's a very elegant machine. They hauled heavy express passenger trains from New York to Chicago. They did this journey in 15 and a half hours. They were perfect for their job. They could produce enormous power at speed. Did you ever get to run your hand along the carcass of, of a real Niagara? No, I've never been to the United States of America. No, I've never seen one. And of course, they were all cut up by 1956, every one. There were 27 of them built. When did you start building your Niagara, John? I started in autumn 1974. I was determined to make the thing as accurately as possible. 
The actual labour of construction, I wouldn't say is difficult. It's just time-consuming and requires a great deal of um, what I would call commitment and stamina. It's I like, was going a, to say, like, composing, like composing an opera. But is it, it's never taken yeah. you 24 years to compose a piece of music. How did you sustain yourself in that length of time building a yes, locomotive? But yes, but don't forget that during these 24 years, I was having to earn my living. So it, this was a hobby. I should say it was probably 12 or 15 man years of work. Oh, a mere <laughs> blink of an eye? A mere blink of an eye, yes. <laughs> Do um, you drive it yourself? I'm not particularly interested in driving. I have driven it on occasion, but I, I have a friend of mine who likes driving it and drives it so well that I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't wish to try and compete, quite frankly. <laughs> Is that not terribly frustrating, though? Because here, here's this man enjoying the fruits of 24 years' labour on your part. I enjoy looking at it. I enjoy listening to it. I enjoy watching it. I like the fact that other people can get some pleasure out of it. Beast. I, I didn't think it would be quite so impressive, even though we were talking about a, a model. I mean, it's three tons of um, high-tech engineering well ahead of its time. What's happening at the moment? David, my friend, is, is lighting up the fire. At this stage, we're, we're simply burning wood, which is soaked in either paraffin or diesel fuel. While we're waiting for it to build up steam, can we head back to your workshops and have a look at some of the equipment there? Yes, by all means. Great. Great These drawings must be quite important though. Well, without the drawings it's impossible to, to make the model, of course. These are the drawings from the New York Central Historical Society. Um, this is a, a very small, simple one, which shows the shape of the number plate which goes on the front of the engine, and this is the New York Central logo. There's something fabulously complicated underneath it. Uh, I dread to ask what uh, this mass of interconnecting lines means. This um, is a side view uh, of the locomotive. This drawing is made to a scale of one and a half inches to the foot. I'm working at two and a quarter inches to the foot, so I add half again to what is here. How do you go, John, from these very intricate drawings into actually making the parts that will form the train? Well, there are various methods of, of, of making parts, of course. Uh, some parts uh, have to be cut out of sheet metal. The mainframes of the locomotive were cut out of one-inch plate and machined all over. Uh, there's a lot of plate work, but um, some components uh, it's convenient to have cast. For example, here we have an iron casting, which is part of a water pump which goes on the engine. I noticed this weighty tome over here with a, with a part on it. I mean, is this how to build your own large American locomotive? Well, it's something which uh, you really don't want to be without. I think I mentioned um, earlier that uh, uh, I, I had a number of drawings from the New York Central Historical Society and also this cyclopedia, which dates from 1941, which can, contains drawings and photographs of a large number of... Uh, manufacturers' components which the locomotive builders would have purchased off the shelf to fit onto the locomotives. In this case, we have uh, working drawings and a photograph of the injector that was fitted to this locomotive. And um, I had enough information here and here to make the model which you here see. This, this in fact, is made of lost wax castings. Well, look, I've just seen a plume of smoke uh, on the horizon. Do you think steam's up and we might be able to clamber aboard? Could well be. Let's go and see, shall we? Okay, dog. Here she is, the beast at rest. Do you know how many rivets you've put into her? I can't really say. I think there are about 4,000 in the tender, but how many there are elsewhere, I really don't know. John, I don't know what you're going to say to this question, but any chance of me adopting a Casey Jones type role at this point? Well, you certainly won't be able to drive the locomotive, uh, obviously for insurance purposes, but you can certainly sit in and I can run through the controls with you. Fantastic. So you can get an idea. Excellent.
It's a tight squeeze. It is a tight best. squeeze. Yes. It looks a bit like, um, a, a, rather ironically, um, a high-tech Formula One car interior. Well, it's, 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 it's better than a Formula One car, believe me. Shall, shall I try? More exciting. Is, is there any kind of etiquette for mounting the, the I locomotive? Say so, no, it's entirely Fair enough. You. I'll just jump in now. I'm terrified of touching anything in case it goes off. Oh, it's it it fantastic. Can you see anything in there? Uh, yes, I can. I can see uh, the water feed pump. Right, John, can you take us through uh, the essential instruments? Yes, well, these are the water gauges showing oh. the level of water in the boiler, which are probably the most important um, uh, item in the cab for the driver to look at for safety reasons. Above that, there is a boiler pressure gauge showing the steam pressure in the boiler. What sort of speed would this do? Well, we think that um, the maximum speed that we've achieved on this railway is probably about 20 miles an hour. But we, we don't know exactly because we don't really know how accurate my, my speedometer is. Does it feel fast though? Oh, yes, it does. Yes, yes. Are you sure I can't have a go at driving it? I'm, I'm sure, uh, absolutely. It's, it's quite impossible, um, quite apart from your lack of experience. Um, what about enthusiasm? Doesn't it count for anything these days? Enthusiasm accounts for a great deal, but an insurance company won't accept enthusiasm as a qualification for driving a steam locomotive. How much would you sell this beauty for? How much what? Would you sell this beauty for? I wouldn't sell it for anything on the earth. <laughs> really? No. Well, will you take me on a ride on it as a compromise? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You do have first class, I take it? Yes, for some people, not for everybody. Board! I know what people mean when they talk about the golden age of steam. 